work because it doesn't look like anything that I know after doing this for 35 years. Was ist das, Gunther? Ich ist ein Radio. Radio. Ja, das ist ein Radio, ja. Schusenhofer's work seems to have that uh, ability to transport diverse people in the same way that an inkblot test does. I've seen it over and over again. You look at something and say, well, what is this image? And one person will say, oh, it's a radio. Oh, it's a car. Oh, it's an airplane. It's a comb. It's a... And everyone is, is bringing their own brain to the work. Um, and that's a wonderful thing. Everyone is desperately trying to put outsider art into a nice, neat little box. And it doesn't really fit in because it's something that happened independently. It's something that owes nothing to art history. And when you, have some, when you, when you owe nothing to art history, you really have a problem. This work that was not made with that trapping of you know, will I, get, will I get into one of the good galleries? Will I be in the Biennale? I mean, it's very nice that it's there. It, should, it deserves a place in the Venice Biennale. But at the same time, I don't want to be so much part of that whole, oh, what's the market doing? Because then you're like financial stocks. You should love it because it, it inspires you to love, not because people say, oh, this is safe now to love because it's, it's selling big. We can all get in on it, you know? Like, what is that? I don't want that. Well, you know, we had grand ambitions about 10 years ago that we were going to try to create a whole category at Christie's of outsider art. Unfortunately, there weren't enough investor, speculator types who would be willing to uh, fuel the market by reselling. That is, I think, one of the problems we had with creating uh, an auction category. Many of the passionate outsider art collectors are in some ways as obsessive as the artists they collect, and uh, they love the works they have, and they keep them. Aren't they beautiful? Yes, they are very beautiful. I've, I've been collecting this group of cars probably for about 30 years whenever I could, either if they came up in auction or from private collections or wherever. Madge Girl was controlled by a spirit guide who she named as Minor Rest. Minor Rest, she yeah, called Yeah, in my inner rest. I would think that these are a repeated self-portrait over and over and again. There's an obsessive quality to many of these artists. And often, like the British outsider, Madge Gill, they work in isolation. Where professional artists forge their creations in a dialogue with art history, the outsider is engaged in a monologue. One of the exciting things about seeing an outsider artist you've never seen before is that you've never seen anything like it before either. Because each outsider artist is like an art movement of one. And they invent their own techniques, their own disciplines, their own ways of working, and their own visions. And that's why they come up with something completely individual each time. Now, this is a little picture by Joe Coleman. It's a self-portrait of Joe just after he'd carried out his autopsy on a dead body in a Hungarian hospital. And that's, that's him there. It's called The Pathologist. I couldn't afford his paintings. They're so expensive. There's big painters about this big. So I said, oh, Joe, can you just do me a little tiny painting that I could just about afford? And so that's what done. But our little grandson was really frightened of it. Welcome to the auditorium.
I got kicked out of art school, and then they asked me to be an advisor many years later after I had a certain following at that point. And so I said, okay, I, I'll be an advisor. So the, immediately I told the kid, get, get the fuck out of school, because you're not going to learn a goddamn thing in that school. You have to go out there and live, you know, and that's where you're going to find your art, not in art school. At home, it was really pretty fucked up because, you know, my father was a pretty violent alcoholic and he tormented my, my mother and the rest of the family. And I found release and, and uh, relief in, in drawing. When I started painting, my brush strokes were bigger. And now, now I barely even move my brush. And it's a one hair brush and I use jeweler's lenses. I'm looking for more and more information on the surface of the painting. Even though it's coming out of somewhere, I mean, out there or, or in here, but it's appearing here and that's where I'm finding it. And the, the more minute that I look, the more that I find. I try to take care of the misfits, you know, and uh, the losers. The losers never get to write their side of history, except in my work. Joe Kilman's customers include Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio. Prices for his paintings have risen steadily, and there's now a waiting list. People want the work quicker than his one-hair brush can paint it. In fact, such is his popularity, but in a peculiar twist, he's now banned from showing at the Outsider Art Fair on account of being too successful. What does this tell us? Perhaps it suggests we fetishize these artists. We prefer them to be poor and struggling. Across town lives one such artist who fits that bill. Hi, welcome to New York. Come in. Come in here. Yeah, now you can do. It's OK? When Ionel Talpasan was still a boy in Romania, he had an encounter with what he believes was a UFO, which bathed him in a strange blue light. His life's work is an attempt to make sense of this. This is uh, my spaceship, UFOs. I work many sites. I make this soy because the color, because this blue, color blue, for me represents double energy, the inspiration me to create this uh, drawing, art, and everything. Second spaceship we have for large. But it's still not finished in process. Because I'm a problem, financial problem, I can finish. Go ahead. Maybe you like it. All my art I do, uh, uh, I, I do experiment. Look at the a lot of, lot of material. I broke a lot of things, a lot of canvas. The artist is like an astronaut. With the mind, you can travel the entire universe. Lionel's parents sold him for just under £100 when he was a baby. As a young man, he took drastic measures to escape the Ceausescu regime and swam the Danube from Romania to Yugoslavia, eventually finding refuge in the United States. He's lived in this one-room apartment in Harlem for 18 years. It was at the Outsider Art Fair. I had a booth there, I used to show, show the outsiders work there, but Einel used to be outside in the snow every day selling his artwork on the street. So in a way Einel shot himself in the foot because he's, he was always outside selling his work for a fraction of the cost that I would like to have sold it for on my booth at the fair. 
Uh, I sell pens for me sometimes. Uh, I'm starting actually for $10, the size. Sometimes a couple hundred dollars, but a couple hundred dollars sometimes. But it's not happening every day. I like to sell direct. No consignments, no contract. Low. I need money. I need to survive. Uh, this is the original in colors, the way you look my spaceships we have all. Actually, this position. I have uh, some uh, idea about vacuum. Some way like, take the vacuum, the vacuum transformation and energy and field system, field magnetic, anti-magnetic uh, dimension. I know I have only one idea. I have six. You don't need it to make bomb atomic to destroy this planet. You need to use this source of energy to travel the universe forever. But it's different time, different space, different work. See? I do different. My art is unique art. Unique mind, unique art on planet Earth. Ionel may be ploughing a lonely furrow, but then again, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus when he said the world was round. They all laughed when Edison recorded sound. The alternative guide to the universe is brimming with mavericks. Self-taught artists, unlicensed architects, fringe physicists, and visionary inventors. Hayward Gallery director Ralph Rugoff treated me to a private tour as it was hung. There's something about his movement. It's quite scary, isn't it? Wu Yu Lu is a farmer in China who's taught himself how to make robots using, again, whatever materials at hand. And he's made robots who commit suicide, robots who smoke cigarettes, robots who do the dishes for him. <laughs> and uh, this is a child robot. When you think about the idea of a child robot in China, given China's policy of only one child per yeah. family, who's going to be a sibling for all those yeah. single children? This is a remarkable French artist named Marcel Storr. These are all made in the 1970s. He was uh, an orphan, he was deaf. He worked as a street sweeper in the Bois de Boulogne and he would go home at night and make these incredibly intricate drawings. And these were cityscapes he called megalopolises and this was his blueprint for the rebuilding of Paris, which he was convinced was gonna be destroyed in a nuclear attack. This was one of his last unfinished works. Oh. And I mean, it gives you a sense of how he worked, which is great. Incredibly detailed, the yeah. painstaking, elaborate lines that he's drawing, where they're so small, I can't even see them with, a, with my eye anymore, you know? Yeah. It's this idea also 